time is 7.30. We'll now call this regular meeting of the of Board of the Selectmen Board of to order. The first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everyone please rise? And I'd like to have a moment of silence for Buddy Hernandez. Buddy is, was the um, captain of Fire Company Number 2 previously, and he's also the father of Selectman Michael Hernandez. So would we have a moment of silence first for Buddy? The next item on tonight's agenda is the approval of minutes from the May 4th, 2022 meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Has everyone reviewed them? I'll make the motion we approve the minutes. I'll Thank second you. that. Thank you, John and Sean. <coughs> Any errors, changes, omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion passes. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item is acceptance of the agenda. Now, tonight I do have some changes for tonight's agenda. So under new business on item E, I'd like to change, we're going to be talking about setting a public hearing date and a special town meeting. I'd like to change the proposed time of the public hearing to 7 p.m. So cross out 715 and that will be seven. And then the special town meeting will be 7.10 p.m., not 7.20 p.m. And then we have a, <coughs> another um, public hearing and special town meeting to set. So there'll be an, uh, a new item F, and it will be called Supplemental Appropriation Police Private Duty, as well as Gas and Diesel. Police Private Duty and Gas and Diesel with a 705 public hearing and a 720 special town meeting. You get that, Sharon? Okay, so then the action on affordable housing plan, that will be item G under new business and refunds of excess payments will be item H. And I would like to add an item I as well, and we'll add the right to farm ordinance and a discussion on that. So we'll put that on the agenda. And those are the changes I have. So would someone like to approve the, or make a motion to approve the agenda as amended? I'll uh, make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. And I'll second that. Thank you, Sean and Ralph. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed, any abstention? <clears throat> Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Moving on, we will go to communications and correspondence. I do have some communications and correspondence this evening. Um, I, have, I have three proclamations today. And these are all, these are all worthy proclamations of their, of their own weeks. But for some reason, and I don't know who puts the national weeks together, <laughs> but it happens to be National Police Week, National Public Works Week, and National Emergency Medical Services Week. So we have three proclamations, and I, I would like to read them into the record. Maybe we could take turns. Would someone, would anyone like to volunteer to read any of the proclamations? I'll read uh, oh. emergency. Okay, Sean, you can read emergency. I'll take police. Police. I'll do public works. There we go. Thank okay. You. <laughs> Who would like, Sean, do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Proclamation National Emergency Medical Services Week, May 15th to the 20th, 2022. <clears throat> Whereas the National Emergency Medical Services Week is to honor the dedication of EMS personnel across the country who respond <coughs> and provide life-saving services to the sick and injured 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 
And whereas this year's theme is EMS rising to the challenge, and whereas the citizens of Portland benefit from the knowledge, skills, and dedication of these <coughs> EMS specialists as they work together to ensure prompt and appropriate treatment at the scene on the way to the hospital and in an emergency department. And whereas the emergency responders answer and are responsive to all kinds of medical emergencies despite weather conditions or hazards, dramatically improving survival and recovery rate, and whereas emergency care personnel give selflessly of themselves for the welfare of others, whether career or volunteer, serving the public as trained professionals. Now therefore, be it resolved, that Ryan J. Curley, first selectman of the town of Portland, Connecticut, to signify <coughs> our appreciation, do hereby proclaim May 15th through the 20th, 2022, National Emergency Medical Services Week, and call upon all our citizens in the community to recognize and respect EMS personnel, not just during this week, but throughout the year. Signed, Ryan J. Curley, first selectman, Board of Selectmen, John H. Dillon, Michael S. Hernandez, Robert W. Hetcher, Jr., <coughs> Sean P. Manning, Michael A. Pelton, Ralph R. Zampano. Thank you, Sean. Well, okay, proclamation, National Public Works Week, May 15th to 20th, 2022. Whereas public works professionals help maintain a community strength by working together on infrastructure, facilities, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, higher, high quality of life, and well being of the people of the town of Portland. And whereas these infrastructure, facilities, and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private sector, who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, <coughs> water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential for our citizens. And, where, and whereas it is in the public interest it is in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and children in the town of Portland to gain knowledge of and to maintain a progressive interest and understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs in their respective communities. And whereas the year 2022 marks the 62nd annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association slash Canadian Public Works Association, with ready and resilient as the theme. <clears throat> now therefore be it resolved that I, Ryan J. Curley, for a selectman of the town of Portland, Connecticut, hereby proclaim the week of May 15 to 20th, 2022, as National Public Works Week in the town of Portland, Connecticut, and urge all citizens to join with representatives of the American Public Works Association slash Canadian Public Works Association in government agencies and activities, events, and ceremonies designed to pay tribute to our public works professionals, engineers, managers, and employees, and to recognize the substantial contributions they make to protect our national health, safety, and quality of life. <coughs> In witness whereof, I do hereby set my, set my hand and cause the seal of Portland to be affixed this 18th day of May in the year 2022 by Ryan J. Curley, First Selectman, Town of Portland, Connecticut, and the Portland Board of Selectmen, John H. Dillon, Michael S. Hernandez, Robert W. Hetrick, Jr., Sean P. <coughs> Manning, Michael A. Pelton, and Ralph R. Zampano. Thank you, Ralph. And last but certainly not least, Town of Portland Proclamation National Police Week, May 15th through 21st, 2022. Whereas in 1962, President John F. Kennedy signed a proclamation designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day and the week in which it falls as National Police Week. And whereas National Police Week pays special recognition to those law enforcement officers who have lost their lives in the line of duty for the safety and protection of others. And whereas there are more than 900,000 law enforcement officers serving in communities across the United States, including the dedicated members of the Portland Police Department. 
and whereas the members of the Portland Police Department play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of the citizens of Portland, often working long hours in dangerous situations to protect our lives, liberty, and property, and whereas it is important that all citizens understand the challenges, duties, and responsibilities of their police department, and that members of our police department recognize their duty to serve the people. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the town of Portland, Connecticut, formally recognizes and honors the members of the Portland Police Department who work daily to keep our community safe, and we to signify our appreciation and pay tribute to law enforcement personnel who have been killed or disabled in the line of duty, hereby proclaim the week of May 15th to 21st, 2022 as Police Week. In witness whereof, I do hereby set my hand and cause the seal of Portland to be affixed this 18th day of May in the year 2022 by Ryan J. Curley, First Selectman, Town of Portland, Connecticut, Board of Selectmen, John H. Dillon, Michael S. Hernandez, Robert W. Hetrick, Jr., Sean P. Manning, Michael A. Pelton, and Ralph R. Zampano. Thank you, John. And thank you again to our public works, our EMS, and as well as our police. We're very fortunate in the Town of Portland to have some fantastic people working for us on our behalf. <clears throat> Under communications and correspondence, I, I do want to let the board know that I received a, I've been in contact with Chris Cody. Chris is a, an owner of Chris Cody's Golf Shop and he also owns uh, the, the driving range at the Four Corners. <laughs> and Chris has um, reached out to our Economic Development Commission and we're really trying to look at ways that we can beautify our main street and one of the, and Chris had a really great idea mm -hmm. to and he offered to help clean up the island that when you come into town that has been overgrown and we have this beautiful Portland historic Portland sign that's made of brownstone and so Chris has offered to help clean that up in in coordination with the Portland Garden Club and so if you drive by it today Chris and his crew have done a lot of work and it looks so much better than it than it did before and the garden crew is going to, the garden club excuse me is going to come in and do their thing and and really make it beautiful so i just want to thank um i just want to thank chris cody and you know for for offering to help and hopefully you know that will start a a new trend of maybe some public private partnerships that we can we can continue to build upon um do they want to delay that because that is supposed to be changed it is supposed to be changed, but I didn't but, want them to waste their time or energy on it, and it's supposed to change the shape majorly when it, Elm Crest goes yeah. through. It is. Yeah, but it's going to be a while. Like it's going to be a little okay. bit. Yeah. At least right now, it, it looks much, <laughs> much better. So I just yeah. wanted to say that I think that's a great thing, and and so thank you to Chris um, and uh, for for helping us out with that, and and the Portland Garden Club. Um, that's all I have for communications and correspondence. So we'll open it up to public comment. I do see some people in the audience tonight. Would anyone like to speak? Sam, would you like to come up? To yep, to the po yeah. We have a podium here. And if you could just state your name and address when you get up to the podium. <coughs> My name is Samuel Newsom. And I live at 80 East Main Street. Good evening. My name is Sam Newsom, and I'm here to advocate that Portland adopt Connecticut General Statute Section 19A 341, also known as the right to farm, into our town ordinances and officially declare ourselves a right to farm community. What is the right to farm, and why should we care? It sets aside certain byproducts of farming, such as noise odor and dust and states that they are legally no longer declared a nuisance and protects the farmer against harmful and harassing lawsuits from their neighbors. Connecticut's right to farm law was passed in 1981 by Governor Bill O'Neill who is a friend to the farming community and a resident of our neighboring town of East Hampton. Connecticut's right to farm law does not define agricultural and farming operations or clearly set out that these laws only pertain to commercial agriculture or farms over a certain acreage. 
And that key point is a wonderful legacy Governor O'Neill left us, as that means we all have a right to farm our land despite our size. As long as three key points are met. Number one, that you have been in operation for a year or longer. Number two, that your operations have not substantially changed. And number three, that you are following generally accepted agricultural practices. However, there are some key stipulations. The Right to Farm Act does not preempt municipal ordinances, which is why over a dozen communities already, and most recently the town of Stafford, have voted to adopt the state's law as their own in solidarity to their town's <coughs> agricultural heritage and by officially declaring themselves a right to farm community, agree to repeal any local ordinances contrary to the state right to farm act. It does not protect against zoning infractions. It does not protect against any inconveniences stemming from willful intent or negligent behavior. It simply protects farmers who are meeting their town standards and following generally accepted farming practices from being harassed and threatened by their neighbors. I'm gonna share a quote taken directly from Colchester's Right to Farm page. It seems that city slickers are, pr are prone to being offended by the smell of fresh manure when they move into a rural community. We are in the midst of a paradigm shift in, agri in agriculture. Less than a decade ago, not mowing your lawn was considered an eyesore, especially in wealthier communities. This very morning on NBC Connecticut, they reported on how an entire neighborhood in West Hartford was participating in No Mow May, allowing their lawns to grow and provide a safe haven for pollinating bees. The state of Maine also just approved an amendment to their state's constitution called the Right to Food, which grants Maine residents the, quote, unalienable right to grow, raise, produce, and consume food of their choice, end quote. We are farming more than ever to feed a growing population on land, on less land as developments keep being built. The farmland we have left here in town is scarce and unaffordable. And we need to now more than ever protect our townspeople's right to farm their land and protect their ability to be sustainable in order to weather the storm that is our current economic turmoil. The town has already expressed its support for the, right, for the right to farm movement, both on the town Facebook page and in its own town documents. In Portland's current plan of conservation and development, section H labeled support farms and farming states explicitly, and I quote, as the town continues to develop residentially, conflicts between farms and residents may increase over such issues as odors, wandering livestock, noise, trespass, et cetera. Portland should adopt a right to farm policy that supports agricultural activities by protecting farmers from nuisance claims that may arise from the normal operation of their farm in close proximity to residential development. In conclusion, like many of you, my forefathers came to America via, uh, via Ellis Island. Their first glimpse of our beloved country was that of New York City. That city was built on Portland brownstone that was hauled out of our quarries with oxen raised on Portland farms. We honor that heritage with the ox cart outside. We even have the oxen on our own town seal. And now that we have honored our heritage, let's protect our future and keep making this town a wholesome and wonderful place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Any other public comments here in the audience? Is there any public comment online? And we will talk about that right to farm later in the meeting. So thank you, Sam. And seeing no other public comment, we will move on to old business, <coughs> the monthly report from the Committee on Solidarity. I know that April Graves is unable to make it tonight. Ralph, do you have an update? Yes, I do. Um, she sent me notes on what she wanted to just point out. Um, just reiteration of events that are going on. Juneteenth will occur on June 18th. Um, the Pride event will occur on June 25th. 
There's a disability form on June 8th, so that's a new one. I don't have details on that one, sorry. Um, she also said that the banners that they're going to put on Main Street will be, uh, will be in, on, in by Saturday and will be delivered to Bob Shea. And um, she just wanted to point out that they wanted to thank our plumbing for their generous donation of the food for Juneteenth. They've donated enough food for 150 to eat for free. That's great. So those were her notes for me to pass on. Ralph, uh, Juneteenth, what time does that start? <sighs> Sorry, I don't. I'll, I'll find I, it. Yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head. Is it on our website? It might be. I think so. Yeah, if I dug in my pile, I'll, I'll look in my pile. I might have it in here. <laughs> I thought it might have been on that, those notes. That's fine. No, she it's just gave me the two? dates. 11 to 2? 11 to 2 does stick in my mind. That's yeah, I, I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. So thank you, Ralph. We'll move on to appointments uh, and reappointments to boards and commissions. <coughs> any, any appointments tonight? You have some appointments? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, so um, I do have uh, two nominations for appointment. Uh, the first one is for uh, Nancy Brault of Lake Road. Uh, to be for alternate on the conservation committee. Um, so that's the first one that I have. Uh, Do you want to take them one at a time? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yep. I'll, I'll second the motion. If, that, if you're making that as a motion, yes. I'll sorry, I should it. have said it in terms mm -hmm. of a motion. <laughs> <laughs> I met Nancy. She's she's very nice, very accomplished. Great. Thank you. <coughs> Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Extension motion passes unanimously. Um, and the second one I have, um, I'm going to make a motion to appoint Christy Fuller of Riverside Street to as an alternate on the committee on solidarity. So, second, I'll second that. Thank you, Sean. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And any other appointments? That's no, it. That's okay. it. Great. Moving on to new business. Item A is revision to the resolution creating a facility study committee to investigate capital improvement and space needs for Portland schools and outlining procedures and responsibilities for the facility study committee. And I spoke with our superintendent uh, Dr. Britton about this and the, the committee has made significant progress I believe uh, Bobby you're you're on the committee yes. is there anyone else here on the committee uh, Mike, Mike is, Mike yes, is Mike as well is, I yes. thought so and so it it seems that while they're while they're moving along and doing work that they would like it a little extra time they were scheduled to report to us in June and they are now requesting to report to us between September 1st and October 1st. So I think that they're going to use, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bobby, but they're going to use the leftover or the extra time to reach out to the public and try to gauge public feedback on this and try to see you know, what, what the townspeople would like to see uh, with this facilities. Yes, they wanna try and see how they feel we should go they still have a lot of options for the buildings, so they want to see what the public thinks, and maybe that will steer them in the direction of what to choose. Okay. So I think that's a pretty reasonable request for, for them, and certainly I know we're all looking forward to seeing what they, what they come up with. Um, would someone like to introduce the resolution and possibly waive the reading? I'll uh, introduce the resolution and waive the reading. Um, introduce Resolution Board of Selectmen, Portland, Connecticut, June 2nd, 2021, revised May 18th. Resolution creating a facility study committee to investigate the capital improvement and space for Portland schools, outlining procedures and responsibilities for the facility study committee. I'll second that resolution. Thank you, John. Thank you, Sean. 
Uh, and I just want to point out that this was the original resolution. The date was June 2nd, 2021. And this is revised as of May 18th, 2022. So um, any discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion passes. Thank and, you. And I believe if anybody wants to read these, they're on the town website and under tonight's meeting and uh, in the attachments for the meeting. Right? Correct. Yes. So the every all of this is, I believe. Everything should be, and if and it's all public, <coughs> and if anyone needs a copy of anything, they can just reach out to the first selectman's office, and we'll make sure that we get that. Um, next up is we had some some positive news last week with the adoption of the town budget, which passed on Monday, May 9th. And so every year after the budget passes, we must set the mill rate for, fis for the fiscal year, this year being 2022 to 2023. And so you'll see there's a resolution in front of you where the mill rate is now, um, would be 32.44 for fiscal year 2022 to 2023. And is there a, is there a motion to approve this resolution? I'll make a motion to approve it. Okay, would you like to read it? So, yeah, no. thank you. Resolution Board of Selectmen, Town of Portland, Connecticut, May 18th, 2022. Adoption of the mill rate for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Whereas the 2022-2023 budget for the Town of Portland estimates that 4,597,950 will be received from the state of Connecticut. And without this, the mill rate would be 37.39 mills. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mill rate for the fiscal year 2022-2023 be and is hereby set at 32.44 mills and be it further resolved that the tax shall be due and payable July 1st, 2022 and January 1st, 2023. I'll second. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion passes. Thank you. The next item that we do on an annual basis is the approval of the non-union administrative pay plan for fiscal year 2022-2023. This was all emailed to you, uh, and so you should have reviewed this already. Um, we can take some time, if you'd like, to, to look through it. Um, and seeing none, we'll, I mean, if there's no discussion, I'll entertain a motion to approve the non-union administrative pay plan. I'll, I'll approve it if you want me to read it as it yeah. sits. Just, yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Resolution Board of Selectmen, Town of Portland, Connecticut, May 18th, 2022, non-union administrative pay plan for fiscal year 2022-2023. Resolved that the 2022-2023 pay plan for non-union part-time specialists, seasonal employees, and administrative, professional, executive, and elected officials as outlined on the attached being is hereby adopted. I'll second that. Thank you, John. Thank you, Sean. <coughs> Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion passes. Thank you. The next item on tonight's agenda is the adoption of other budgets. So every year we must do a transfer to the, the departments that, that receive a, a direct transfer in the operating budget. And those are animal control, the animal control fund, town aid road fund, youth services, resource recovery, building maintenance, par and parks and rec. So if you look, this is, and these are the numbers that were approved with the budget, but we have to do this, this formal process. So I will entertain a motion, or uh, entertain a motion to approve this. Someone would like to read that? I'll, uh, I'll do it. Thank you. Um, resolution Board of Selectmen Town of Portland, Connecticut, May 18th, 2022. Adoption of the other operating budgets for the fiscal year 2022-2023. Resolved that the other operating budgets for the fiscal year 2022-2023 as listed below and further outlined on the attached be hereby adopted. Animal Control Fund, 
$80,759. Town Aid Road Fund, $239,056. Youth Services Fund, $125,535. Resource Recovery Fund, $380,091. Building Maintenance Fund, $82,000. Parks and Recreation Fund, $516,390. Be it further resolved that the capital improvement budget for the fiscal year 2022-2023 as outlined on the attached in the amount of $935,595 with $258,000 being town source funded projects, $235,000 water source fund projects, $380,000 sewer source fund projects and $62,595 state of Connecticut funded projects be and is hereby adopted. I'll second that motion. Thank you both. Any discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. The next item under E on new business is the is to set a public hearing date and a special town meeting for supplemental appropriations. Now this is regarding um, the school construction fund and capital improvement plan and the capital improvements plan. So if you recall during our budget deliberations, we talked about the need for a fuel pump at the uh, town garage and the reader monitoring system is is in poor shape and and could fail at any time as well as the need for a plow for a large dump truck and so these were items that we removed from the capital budget during during the budget but we are looking at still funding them because we do we do have a, have, a, have a definite need for them, as well as we have a need for um, funding the track at the high school. As you recall, we have a, have a bond from the state bond council for $500,736. And we are not entirely sure that that will cover the entire cost of the track replacement. So in order to, to hedge our bets and make sure that we don't fall short and we are able to repair and replace that track as quickly as possible, we are, we are asking to the Board of Selectmen to allocate $250,000 in addition of, of town money to um, make sure that we can cover the costs of the track. So that is what the, these suppl supplemental appropriations are before you. And I think we should read this one when we. Mm. I'll read. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, man. Resolution Board of Selectmen, mm. Town of Portland, Connecticut, dated May 18, 2022. Supplemental appro Appropriation School Construction Fund and Capital Plan Improvements. Whereas there is a need to replace the track at Portland High School Complex, and whereas $500,736 is expected from state funding based on a recent approval by the State Bond Commission, and whereas the town wants to complete the project as swiftly as possible through the various phases, and whereas the money that the town is requesting to move into Fund 24, school construction funds must first be used for the track renovations, and if any funds remain, can thus be used for other school construction and school improvement projects as needed, and whereas other capital improvement plan improvements in Fund 8 are needed for new fuel pumps and reader monitoring systems and a plow for large dump truck, both for the Department of Public Works Highway Department and whereas the fuel pump and reader monitoring system are very aged at the current time and can no longer be updated. And whereas $57,500 is being requested to increase line item 08-141-000-89090, public works slash highway slash fuel, fuel pumps and reader monitoring systems and whereas $15,000 is being requested to increase line item number 08-141-000-89090 
Public Works Highway plow for large dump truck. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Board of Selectmen hereby approves a supplemental appropriations from the general fund balance in the amount of $322,500. The allocations of transfers for the general fund are increases to 01-093-000-90006. Transfer out dash cap non-rec other by $250,000 and increases to 01-093-000-90012 transfer out dash cap non rec town by $72,500. The, fund the funds transferred to fund 24 are to account 24-000-000-0501 interfund transfer in general fund for $250,000. The funds that would be transferred into Fund 08 are as follows. Account number 08-141-000-89090. The Department is Public Works. It's for highway. The explanation are fuel pumps and reader monitoring system. That's for $57,500. The other account, 08-141-000-89090. Public Works, Highway Department is for plow for large dump truck, and that's for $15,000. Those two total $72,500. Thank you, Mike. And, and just so we don't, we're not voting on this tonight. This is to set the public hearing and the special town meeting. So is there a motion to set our public hearing for 7 p.m. On the Supplemental Appropriation School Construction Fund and Capital Plan Improvements. I make a motion we set the public hearing for mm -hmm. 7, 10. 7 o'clock. Oh, 7 o'clock on um, June 1st, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Sean and Bobby. Um, any, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. And then is there a motion to set the special town meeting? For on the supplemental appropriations for school construction fund and capital plan improvements for 7, ten, seven, seven ten. Ten. So moved. Thank you, John. I'll second that. Thank you, Sean. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. And the next item we have is a supplemental appropriation for police private duty and gas and diesel expense and increase to estimated police private duty revenue. So as you know, with police private duty, when police get called to, to jobs, they get paid, you know, and, and so that comes in as extra revenue for the town, but it's also an expense as well. And this past year, with all of the work that we've had, especially on our Aragoni Bridge, that has um, boosted the police private duty line, as well as gas and diesel lines on our budget quite, quite significantly. So we have this supplemental appropriation, um, which I will, I will read into the record, and then we'll set another, another public hearing and, and town meeting date. So I'll read this one. This is supplemental appropriation for police private duty expense and gas and diesel expense, an increase to estimated police private duty revenue. Whereas construction work continues to be performed on the Aragoni Bridge, prompting a need for more private duty police jobs to ensure public safety, and whereas the companies that are doing the work in Portland are required to pay for the town's police private duty services, and whereas revenues in line item number 01000000-0324, police private duty, have come in and are expected to come to continue to increase higher than originally budgeted, and whereas the related private police duty expenditure line number 01023-000-14014 is expected to exceed its original budget amount by 120,000, and whereas the related gas and diesel expenditure line number 01023-000-51001 is expected to exceed its original budgeted amount by 20,000 due to more private duty jobs and higher cost per gallon than expected. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Portland Board of Selectmen hereby approves the supplemental appropriation of $120,000 to the general fund, line item number 01023000014014, police, private police duty, and $20,000 to the general fund, line item number 01023000510001, gas and diesel, and an increase in estimated revenue to line number 01000000024, police private duty in the amount of $140,000. So is there a motion to set the public, public hearing, hearing for 705? Five on June 1st. Yes. So moved. Thank you, John. Second. Thank you, Bobby. <coughs> Any discussion on this? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. And then is there a motion to set the special town meeting on the supplemental appropriation for police private duty expense and gas and diesel expense and increase to estimated police private duty revenue for 7.20 p.m. on June 1st? So moved. Thank you, John. I'll second. second. Thank you, Bobby. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Next up is item G, and this is action on the affordable housing plan annex. And Meg Scat is here this evening with us. And I believe we have Megan Juflis from River Cog as well. She is, and Dave is going to put up the, um, the document if he can so we can look at it. You all got a copy of the affordable housing plan annex. It's the um, concise and really the pertinent information about the housing plan mm -hmm. and um, tonight I'm here to ask you for approval but I'd like to just give you a little background as to how we got here Ryan asked me to be the liaison to the River Cog um, after the February 23rd meeting uh, when Mary um, outlined the plan to the community um, I worked with Megan um, Juflis and Karen Martin and uh, Robert Collins at River Cog and the goal was to um, come up with some strategies and uh, put them into the plan. Um, basically, the affordable pl housing plan satisfies statutory requirements. It's under um, Connecticut General Statute 8-30G. It's quite lengthy. It was passed um, a few years ago. The plan that we have in front of you um, is 79 pages long, and it includes a lot of um, uh, Middlesex County data as well as Portland data. Um, that will be filed with the state of Connecticut on June 1st as it is required. Um, I met with planning and zoning uh, twice and we went over the plan and I did receive their endorsement on, um, and we're gonna look at the plan in a minute and we're gonna look at the strategies that were recommended. Um, they agreed that the, three, the first three strategies have to do with planning and zoning regulations and so they endorsed uh, their, um, their activity in, involved in the plan. Um, the rest of it belongs to the town to take and um, take the initiatives and to um, decide tonight that these are things that you will commit yourself commit the town to um, so this is a guide um, and I want to remind everybody that it's only a guide there's no fines there's no um, slap on the wrist if you don't end up doing this but I think um, what we're um, what I'm seeking and what um, the plan seeks is to have an affordable housing task force that can kind of work with departments and work with developers and work within the town to um, make sure that the plan does does uh, does what it's supposed to, which is to educate the public about affordable housing and then to um, look and, and seek initiatives. And um, I recommend you go back and look at the River Cog um, website if you get a chance, because they um, all the towns in Lower Middlesex County have a, an obligation to do this. The, all the towns in the state of Connecticut have to do this. So there are, there's lots of good ideas, lots of strategies. And again, um, reminding you, it's only a plan. It's the first step um, in talking about providing housing for people of all income stratas and, um, and all ages in a town that is uh, sustainable, that, that will be, have a stable population and, um, and continue to, to be able to at least um, to grow uh, in, in a positive way. And I think pos position-wise, Portland is in a very good position right now. So without further ado, um, Megan is on, 
And uh, if you have looked at it previously and you have any questions, we're here to answer them tonight. Um, and if Dave can take us to page 16, um, I want to just go, you know, you can read through all of the data, you know, how much um, housing we have, what the, the demographics are, the statistics about housing in general. Um, affordable housing is not low-income housing that is subsidized by the government. It's not, it's not um, a Chatham Court or a quarry. Um, Corey uh, Heights. Heights, thank you. There's too many quarries here. <laughs> I have to stop and think which one. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not the um, subsidized housing from the 50s and 60s. Um, this is uh, looking at housing that will allow um, people that are empty nesters to uh, reduce their um, housing needs and find something that's affordable for them. Um, retirees, uh, new families starting out, young professionals. Um, can't afford a five hundred thousand dollar house, and so if we're building those, we're not we're not going to have a population that represents the diversity that we need in order to have a sustainable community. Um, so that being said, um, you can look through it. To page sixteen is the objectives, goals, and um, actions. It's, the, it's basically the last two pages. I'm sorry. Um, go to page fifteen. I think Should that's we go print it out. Okay. And, yeah. Would it start from expand? Four. 14. 14. 14, yeah. Sorry, 14, yeah. yeah. We repaginated, and so um, originally it was page 16. So on page 14, you see objectives, strategies, and um, proposed action steps. Uh, one, two, and three were basically the planning and zoning um, initiatives, and what they agreed to was that. Um, they would, when new projects and developments and requests come to them, they will look at the affordable um, housing plan to, um, to ensure that we are, are considering all the options uh, for affordable housing in Portland. Um, it doesn't require any changes to zoning, but, um, but they said that that would certainly in their, um, in their purview, and that's what they would be looking at. Um, starting with number four, strengthening the town's position on affordable housing. Um, the objective is that it's important to, eff uh, to have effective messaging for awareness and support of affordable housing uh, for all life stages and all income levels, as well as equity, fairness, and regional collaboration. Um, the actions uh, would follow, and the proposed action is that our website should have information. Our social media messaging should have information. Um, I don't think anybody can really object to that. Um, forming community partnerships with coalitions, nonprofits, the town planning officer to encourage and inform our community about affording ho affordable housing and all matters of housing. Um, I think that's a reasonable um, uh, action as well. Portland should partner with a nonprofit or other towns to provide local workshops and forums on affordable housing. And we were very fortunate this year that the task for the coalition on solidarity hosted four different forums about housing. Um, homelessness, uh, affordable housing, um, living in low-income housing, and um, and also zoning. They 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 took up the issue of zoning in four different uh, forums this year through the library, which I think was very informative. That will continue because this is not going to go away. We're going to continue to see initiatives, um, and then report to the community at large on the progress of actions taken. And I think that's important to let the town know what we're doing. <laughs> from time to time. Megan, do you have any comments on that section at all? No? Any questions on that section? No. No? Um, the next one is number five, strengthen the town's capacity to further, afford, uh, further affordable housing. Um, implementation of the recommendations of this plan may require resources, may require resources, an additional level or, of town or staff oversight. Um, and Ryan and I had talked um, we're going to have a new town planner, and, and um, that should be on his uh, list of things that he might be um, involved with in terms of um, town planning, because that's where it begins, and then planning and zoning gets involved. So the actions that would be proposed would be create an inventory of affordable housing uh, in Portland, and, um, and also the units that might be available in the future. Brainerd Place um, would not it's not affordable housing per se, but it's apartments, and they are going to, um, you know, be uh, rated at whatever the going uh, rents are. So, again, when we get those units on on board, it would be nice to know that we have 99 or 100 new apartments that are available. 
um, establish a relationship with landlords and the Portland Housing Authority to review best practices and policies related to housing. Um, and this goes back to multifamily housing. It goes back to refurbishing um, or renovating buildings that might be um, not in use as they were originally um, uh, planned. Um, it could be a, a, a storefront or an office building or whatever that has uh, vacant um, space upstairs. So working and trying to identify those areas that, um, that could conceivably be affordable housing. And then seeking grants from federal and state entities related to affordable housing and the prevention of homelessness. And you all know that Portland has a um, $281,000 um, homeless grant right now working with um, the MMW, uh, uh, MMW uh, group out of uh, Meriden uh, in New Haven. We are, um, you know, dealing with people that are about to lose their houses, and through the 211 line, um, that is happening, and we have um, had some success. There's not a lot of inventory in the area, but um, uh, Cheryl and Mercy Housing are doing a very good job right now of answering that need, and that also puts us in a position in Middlesex County because. Because that grant, <coughs> excuse me, that grant is available to um, uh, to be used as they identify housing needs across Middlesex County, it puts Portland in the driver's seat a little bit. So we can talk more about that at another time. Um, any questions about any of the number five um, actions? Any changes that any wording changes? Because sometimes a word um, can change the the meaning of something. But I think. No, everybody's good with so far. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, continue our relationship with River Cog. They have done an incredible job of data collection and analysis uh, and working with a, a firm called SLR. They were able to put together a, a, a Middlesex County um, analysis for housing and transportation and jobs and all of the things that make uh, a, a county or make this region of Connecticut uh, <coughs> sustainable. And then they worked and also gathered the information about Portland. So to continue that relation and develop realistic goals and strategies, not only for Portland but for Middlesex County, I think is important. Um, and then lastly, provide adequate staffing and skill sets to administer affordable housing programs. This goes back to um, making sure that we are um, doing some of the things that, that are outlined here, um, providing uh, training for new hires and staff and also making sure that there's professional development for anybody that is involved in the land use office. There are statutes and there are, the legislature is always busy thinking of what towns can do and so those things, those changes and information need to be um, <coughs> imparted to our, our staff and our community and that's really an important um, aspect of it. Again, not, not, we're not asking for anything that would, you know, this plan is not asking for anything that would be um, outrageous or change what we do right now basically and the last two items basically on page 16 incorporate the affordable housing plan into the conservation and development plan we address housing uh, in the plan and this would become an addendum to the plan it's due to be uh, updated and um, I think it ends in 2016 or, I'm sorry it was 2016 <coughs> through 2026 so that this will um, add new information to what already is there and then this would be um, reviewed in five years, which would be 2027, but can be changed at any time. If we decide that uh, this is not working um, or we have a better idea about what we can do, um, it, can be a, it can be changed. And I think one of the things that was mentioned that I overlooked was, again, that task force for um, affordable housing. I think there's a, an interest in the community um, through the task force on solidarity and also the coalition. Um, to continue the work and to um, make sure that Portland is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So unless you see uh, any changes, Megan can say um, a few words if she wants to say. It was an, really an amazing, I mean, and I print it every time I go into the website, I find more information. I still don't know a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm a newbie to this, but um, it's a fascinating topic, and I think it's timely considering we have um, families that are going to be really struggling in the next few years with their housing needs. We've already seen foreclosures and we've seen evictions and things and I don't think we've seen the, the entire picture. So having affordable housing and, and, and the number of housing 
units that we have in Portland is significant and helpful. Megan? I almost don't want to <laughs> say anything else about you did such a wonderful job. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Meg, for being such a wonderful liaison as part of this project. And we're so grateful at Rivercon that Portland wanted to participate in this regional process. Um, I'm really just here to answer any questions, if there are any, um, to, to help <laughs> facilitate the adoption of this plan. Um, most of the hard work, the legwork has already been done by May. With your help, believe, believe me, Megan helped a lot and so did Karen. Um, did the state give any kind of guidelines or they like did. a scale like <laughs> for the size of Portland, how many units we should have? There's not a scale for the number of units. There's no sort of allocation. <coughs> the actual statute is extremely minimal. It says, you know, over the next five years, the municipality has to adopt a plan showing how they intend to increase their supply of affordable housing. Right. And that's really all the statute says. Um, there is guidance that's out from the state, which is what we use in terms of types of strategies and things to include in the plan, um, but nothing in terms of hard numbers. This is just kind of an initial step. They did outline, though, that we have about 8 point, I've seen two different figures, 8.1% or 8.5% of our um, housing in Portland is affordable at this point, which is a good thing. Um, and again, it's vague. It's vague in terms of numbers, so they're not saying you must do something. Um, but I think, th did I hear 10% as a number that would be a, a, an achievable goal, reasonable, well, achievable goal? <coughs> the 10% comes out of the 830G statute. Um, so that's the statute that says um, at the developer tends to, um, if the town does not have its Ten percent of its housing units um, considered affordable under that statute. Um, that's not directly linked. That ten percent is directly linked to these eight thirty J plans, although that is sort of affiliated. Um, how do we compare to surrounding towns or towns of our size? Megan can answer that because she she knows the the Lower River Valley. And also, we, we've heard some things on the news recently from other towns, so. Well, yeah, I mean, you mean in terms of numbers of units that you have existing? Well, like percentages, because I know, you know, a bigger town is going to have more units, but like if we're at 8%, you know, like what's East Hampton or Haddam or yeah. East Haddam, stuff less. like that. <laughs> less, <laughs> yeah, really less. Um, hmm. So I will say that uh, Middletown is the only town, or the only city in our 17 municipality region that has 10% of their units as affordable. Um, they're over their 10%, so they're 830G exempt. 8% um, is actually pretty good for the 17 town region. Yeah. 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 So, so, so to tie in what, what Bobby just asked too, in the survey, that you guys did in Portland, um, there were some pretty uh, interesting numbers. 68% uh, of respondents felt that Portland was too expensive. 77% uh, uh, feel that affordable or affordable housing is an important component. That makes sense. But certainly 60% plus um, are <coughs> flagging that there's issues with enough housing affordability. How does Portland, in terms of consumer or, 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 uh, or people in town, compare to other ones? Like, are we in the higher range or people um, Feeling that there's less affordable housing in Portland versus other towns around us, besides the raw numbers. I mean, we saw similar responses across across all 17 towns. Well, we only surveyed, I should say, um, the 12 towns that are doing their individual 830J plans as part of this region. Um, but of the surveys, that was fairly consistent. Everyone felt that housing was generally too afford uh, not affordable enough. And there is a formula for affordable housing. So it's based on your um, per capita income. <coughs> it's 80% of the town per capita income. And that would be for a family of four. 
and it should you should be spending about 30% of your income toward housing. And we know from the numbers in the Yannick's report that Portland families are spending sometimes upwards of 50% of their income, which uh, you know doesn't it doesn't help with the rest of the necessities, food, daycare, transportation, um, and all of those things. So um, it, it's really a critical need that we, if we want to keep people coming into town and we want to keep people here, that we, um, that we have housing that has dedicated um, reasonable housing and that it's high quality. You know, we, we can talk, and this is where the task force would come into play because they would look and see where there are some real needs and how buildings could be refurbished, there could be deed restriction, deed restricted um, a, a, a component. Um, you could increase <coughs> density in a housing um, development if somebody wanted to come in and build houses. You can increase the density and lower the cost. You could do, you know, condominium or, uh, you know, other, there, there's other ways to get, uh, to get what we need, but I think it has to be analyzed. Again, this is just a guide and it's the very beginning of a conversation, but it's a very important one. I will say that as we were all knocking on doors last fall, mm -hmm. growing up in this town and having been here my entire life, I met a few couples, quite a few, who are my age, I've known them all my life, and now they're suddenly at that point right. where they're looking to retire, yep. their, you know, their, their income is not what it used to be, right. and they're saying, I've lived in this town my entire life, and now I can't afford to stay here. You know, and then from my perspective with three kids, you know, in their mid 20s and early 30s, I'm seeing the other end of this right. where young families, young kids that grew up here want to stay here or young families want to move in here into this town and they, they just can't swing buying a $360,000, $400,000 house. You know, if you, yeah. if you drive around this town and look at some of the, the tracts of houses that were built many years ago, mm -hmm. I, I think of the Cape houses on Foley Road, mm -hmm. or the ones over here off of Middlesex Avenue. They were built, I think, predominantly for the veterans and the baby boomers when the wars were over and they were looking for housing. Yeah. And I, I think it behooves us to try to find a way to help the young kids in town stay here or the young ones move into this great town and to help the folks who have given their life dedicated to making this place better to be able to stay. You know, and, and I guess my, I, I know the answer, but I'm gonna ask the question anyway. The, I think there are things that we need to do in zoning regulations or through P and Z to really entice builders or folks that have property that is still available for development to develop multiple smaller affordable houses than the couple really large houses and make it affordable for those builders to do so. Is that right? I, well, Megan can answer that, but I, I think it's a, a community effort. I think it's not just gonna be on P and Z mm -hmm. to, to make those changes in the zoning and the regulations. I think, you know, and I would recommend, and, and this is a video, um, the Lower River, uh, Connecticut River Valley Regional Housing Plan details some things that Old Saybrook and Essex and Chester have done. It's not just, not just developers, but sometimes nonprofits will mm -hmm. develop affordable housing. I think of Middletown with the um, Lutheran Church, uh, the Lutheran Church, the home over there. They have built over 55 housing. They've got um, a facility for um, people that need skilled facilities. I mean, the other part of this is that, and, and come to realize that Portland has a water and sewer problem. I don't want to get into all the details, mm -hmm. but water is, you know, 80% of the houses in Portland have um, well. wells and septics. We're not going to run water lines up into Job's Pond or up the mountain. Right. You know, it, it's just not going to happen. And I'm not sure why the Army built and we have water on Freedom Way because we do. We, we have septic, but we have city water. Um, but that being said, and also the topography of Portland is unique, and we've got the river, the floodplains, we've got the state forest. There's a lot of things that don't allow for big developments. You right. know, in Middletown, and I lived there for a while, you know, every piece of farmland has been developed into cluster houses, group houses. I mean, it seems like they still keep finding property that they mm -hmm. can build on. 
and right. sometimes it's wetlands and they've been able to fill it in. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a u unique position that we have to be more thoughtful about it, mm -hmm. but I think it's a community effort that has to be made to look at it and say, yeah, we want to do something that's going to afford people to be able to stay in the community that they were born in, that right. they worked in, and that they raised their families in. And I think Portland has that. A lot of the time, the multi-generational, um, that makes a stable community. And mm -hmm. you know, and then the influx of new people coming and starting families and exactly. growing old here is going to be just as important. But right. we have to have a good mix of inventory. Exactly. So I think it's, I think it's town planning. It's economic development. It's churches. It's 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 everybody working together to say, yeah, this is a great place to live. Um, we want to we want to do more to sustain it. Well, thanks for the work. Yeah. This is so. Uh, yeah, I I'm thrilled to be part of it, and um, I'd like to continue working with Megan and River Cog and um, and see this come to fruition in a very positive way. Because I think Portland has good economic development. It's slow. But you know, I look at East Hampton, who's had all kinds of problems recently. I shouldn't say this, but they're building, you know, a new police station, a town hall, and and they're dealing with water and stuff because they built everything. And then now, once the horse is out of the barn, what do you do? Mm. You know, you can't start pointing fingers and closing the barn door if if he's already gone. Um, and I think we I think we have a good plan, and I think the community is is is, is a good community to have this happen in. So. I would seek your approval tonight without further ado and give us the blessing on it and let us send it to the state and let's work together to make Portland the best place that it could be. Well, thank you, Meg and Megan, for all your work. Um, Megan, would, is there anything else you'd like to say since thank you for joining us? Uh, yeah, thank uh, you. Of course. Um, no, like I said at the beginning, I think Meg has done a wonderful job explaining what we're doing and where we're at. Um, what River Cog is, is trying to do as part of um, the umbrella for all of these 12 plans is to create sort of a framework um, for all of the towns once they have adopted their 830J plans to kind of collaborate and work together. And so we are also looking at things like um, economic development and how that relates to housing, how the environment relates to housing, um, how intertown relationships relate to housing and jobs in one town versus another. So this really is just a first step um, in what I'm sure will be a long road, but looking forward to working mm -hmm. on it together. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you both. Welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you to River Cog as well for all your work. Thank you. Um, <coughs> would someone like to? Yeah. Just to endorse, make a motion to endorse. I make a motion we. To approve? Yeah. Hmm? That's what it says on the, yeah. topic on the agenda. Action on affordable housing. Oh, do we have a resolution? Action on affordable oh, no. housing. No, no, no. We just need someone to make a motion to. Uh, officially endorse the Town of Portland Affordable Housing Plan Annex. Go ahead. Make a I'll make a motion <laughs> to officially adopt the Town of Portland Affordable Housing Plan Annex draft to the Portland Board of Selectmen. That's good. Yeah. We good? It won't be a draft. Yeah. This will be and I'll second that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. Any, <laughs> any discussion on this? No. Great, great job, then. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, I, the only thing I'd say is I, I think it's a great plan and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I think the only challenge I see is looking at the activities that we would do in order to work on adopting it. My, we may be challenged by having enough resources Manpower. to yeah. deliver it Woman but I, I mean it's a great plan it's just yeah. we may be challenged by resources but if I understood Meg then this would be we would be strength in numbers 
working with all these other river communities so it may be that we a lot of small towns may have the problem of supporting this when maybe we all work together to leverage it right and and it's important that I mean this is this is a guide we can we can follow we can you know we don't have to do everything on day one right we can yeah day two day two day two we'll get it done but um, but there is a lot there is a lot here and and um, certainly we do want to make Portland affordable for everyone and Thank you for Thank doing you. all that work. Yes. <laughs> call for the question. We call have for the question. Call for the question. All those in favor of formally adopting the town of Portland affordable housing plan annex? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. Thank you all. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Meg. Thank you both. All right. Next up on the agenda is uh, something that came up during our public comment this evening no. and no. No. No, we have excess yeah. oh. one I'm excess one, that's what I get for adding things to the agenda thank <laughs> you <laughs> that's what I get so refunds of excess payments item H on the agenda <laughs> Nissan Infinity is a farm animal I believe <laughs> it's a joke <laughs> <laughs> Would, what's that? Uh, <laughs> Bobby? Would you like to do it? Yes. Uh, make a motion for a refund of excess payments, Nissan Infinity LLC, $162.79. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. Motion for a refund of excess payment, Nissan Infinity LLC, $384.34. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. Motion for a refund of excess payment, 455 Glastonbury Turnpike, $3,280.31. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. All right, now we can move on to <laughs> item I on tonight's agenda, right to farm ordinance discussion. So. During public comment, we heard from uh, Sam, who's here with us this evening. And I know all the, I think all the selectmen, all the board selectmen members read the Portland Community Facebook page. I know it's my Bible. So, um, so we did see, we did see there was a lot of public support when Sam mentioned that, you know, Portland should consider being a right to farm town. And, and I know I, th I looked into it. I, th I think it's a, it's a good idea to, to open up this conversation, to talk about this, and, um, and at a future meeting, you know, maybe make some action. But I, I, did, I did some research, and before I open it up to discussion, I just, and I can pass out this information to, to the selectmen. I have some, some information on what a right to uh, farm ordinance entails. And so, uh, in my in my research, and I and I spoke with our planning consultants about this, and they are in uh, they're in a lot of towns, and they happen to be in towns already that have a right to farm ordinance on the books. So they were very helpful in talking about you know what what that would entail if Portland were to adopt a right to farm ordinance. And so one of the things that I learned about this was that the the state of Connecticut. Has has a right to farm statute on the books. It's uh, Connecticut General Statute Section 19A-341. Uh, and so, what what a lot of, what some towns have done is that they have adopted a, an ordinance, a right to farm ordinance, to highlight the state statute 
and to emphasize the the point that their town, their municipality, um, believes in in the right to farm and is supportive of the farming community. And so, as Sam had mentioned, a right to farm ordinance is really, you know, if we if we you know go down that road, it, it would be looking at this as a as a support system for a statute that that does exist that is is in place in the town of Portland. It would not uh, supersede any of our zoning regulations. That those would be intact, um, but it, it would it would support our residents who who would you know like to farm and. And we want to do that, I think. I think that that's a good thing. I think Portland, as Sam highlighted earlier, has been a farming community for, for centuries. And so, you know, certainly we don't want to lose that characteristic. And as also, as Sam mentioned, it, it is literally in our plan of conservation and development. And when I saw that, you know, anytime there's, there's something like that that's, that's specifically spelled out in, in our plan of conservation and development, I think it's a good idea for us to take a look at that. So I can pass this. This is uh, this is uh, some cute, you know, some facts on on um, that. And then this is what we have on re on the regulations right now, as far as an as far as small animals and what are allowed based on your acreage. So this is if you want to take a look at that. And then I have um, another uh, summary of the right to farm ordinance that I can pass along too. So, but I'll, I want to open this up to the Board of Selectmen uh, and hear your comments. But I just want to let you know that I've done that initial research on this. So if this one had changed any of our regulations, what would it do? Like, what would it offer someone that they can't currently do now? So I'm just, yeah, so I'm going to, I'm just going to read because that's a good question. This is, this is some key points on this. So um, a local right to farm ordinance provides a policy statement that a municipality supports and encourages local agriculture. So a local right to farm ordinance helps inform new and prospective residents that they are moving into a farming community. A local right to farm ordinance helps provide guidance to municipal enforcement officials on how to respond to issues related to the nu nuisances covered in the state right to farm law. And the nuisances are odor, odor from livestock, manure or fertilizer, noise from livestock, dust created during plowing or cultivation, uh, use of chemicals, provided such chemicals and method of their application conform to practices approved by the Commissioner of Environmental Protection and water pollution from livestock or crop production activities except the pollution of public or private drinking water supplies. Um, also, a local right to farm ordinance should mirror the state statute with a provision that the ordinance does not negate or diminish the authority of the various local regulatory agencies and commissions and a local right to farm ordinance is adopted through a vote of the municipal legislative authority. So that's kind of what we're, we're emphasizing our support for uh, Portland agriculture. So, so if someone, I know the ordinance for like number of chickens, for example, it depends on how much property you have. Yeah, it's so, it's but if someone wants to, I know, but if someone wants to get more chickens, is there a reason why they can't? Well, it falls into that. But yeah, yeah, right. And if they want to plow their whole front yard down, and and grow crops on it, I mean, I'm just I'm just wondering if someone wants to get all sorts of. It, this would not this would not change our zoning regulations. So all the zoning laws that are on the books, we we don't oversee that. Yeah, That's right. overseen by the. But like, like Mike was saying, we don't have zoning regulations as to where you can put a garden. Like you can put a garden from border to border on your property. There's no setback like there is for housing and dwellings and sheds and right. pools and everything else. As, as so, far as I'm aware. So, so, what, so what I'm going with that, like, for, so for example, Sam, in in his post or whatever, said that you know yet you know the animal control was very very friendly when they went there, but was still drawn to there either because of complaints locally from neighbors about what was going on there. Would adopting this 
um, stop that from happening? Would it help educate? No. No. Okay. No, it would not. So, so yeah, so that w it would so not it change. It's like a great idea, but it may not have a big impact. It's not going to have the. It would not have. Uh, that's why I want to be clear that yeah, right. that a right to farm so ordinance would not have an impact on zoning matters. It, yeah. it would, but it, it would show that collectively our support for for individuals or or the right to farm mm -hmm. in the town of Portland. So it is, when towns adopt this, they're they're adopting the state statutes that already exist. So it's not. We're not creating anything different in Portland. We're just highlighting something that's already there. Right. So do you believe it's, in it? It's more of a title. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's our position. Yeah. Yeah. I don't wish to interrupt. Sandra, go to the uh, podium, please. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. I just, mm -hmm. in case anyone asks us the details. Mm -hmm. I've been doing my homework. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You're just a, the guy we want to talk to now. Um, if I may, uh, Basically, there's been a lot of lawsuits on the books, not only because all 50 states have a Right to Farm Act on the books. Um, I believe Colchester was the first one in Connecticut to adopt it, but there was many in Massachusetts that did it too. And basically what was happening is, uh, like we talked about development, and um, I know you had questions about enticing more builders to come in. Well, when they build next to an existing farm, I, like I'm not arguing for myself. I've even, it, you know, I'm, I've already said, you know, zoning is zoning. So if I wanted to help my own case, uh, that would be something I would take up with zoning and land use, not this bit. Um, but basically, what it happens is because we do have a, a lot of existing farms here in Portland. I mean, we have Gatas. The winery counts as a farm. They grow their grapes, right? There's a lot of, uh, I don't know if the uh, the horse stables was a white birch farm. They would, they would probably count. So a lot of those, well, if somebody moves in, say next to white birch, or you develop area, assuming it's available, and now somebody moves in, and now they start complaining over the smell of the horse manure, because common sense is not always that common. You would think if someone's moving in. But what's been happening the past few decades is as you know, the amount of available land is shrinking. People are moving into areas where there's already existing mm -hmm. agriculture. And even though these people are following the town standards, they are following their accepted business practices, they're still getting sued for, uh, I think the most popular one that I have found is loss of enjoyment of the home. And even though somebody might have been farming that land, doing their agricultural thing there for decades. They, they've been losing tons of money because people, they, all of a sudden they move in, they want to complain about the smell, the sound, the dust, and they've been suing them. So right to farm basically backs up the farmer where they can't be sued because uh, they are protected under that right to farm statute. I'll, I'll be honest, I, I think it, it's great. I, I remember a case not that long ago, my wife grew up on Main Street, Goodrich's property, which I think the Gattas were planting down in the back, they had the air cannon that would go off periodically to keep the animals away. And some new person that moved into town immediately started complaining about the boom. And it was an air cannon. We all knew what it was. That, that, that's part of it. And I understand exactly that would have what you're saying. covered under right. Right. That's, I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, my, the only thing I'm a little concerned about is very small properties like. I'm, I'm your neighbor right down the street. Yeah. You know, if I saw Facebook and I saw the pictures of your operation, it's neat and clean, it's beautiful. But how do we ensure, or how do we enforce a situation where somebody comes in and, and suddenly decides they're just gonna dump a pile of manure in their backyard on a third of an acre property and make everybody around there's life miserable? How, well, how do we deal with that? Wasn't one of the stipulations that? that they were in existence for a year? Yes. So it's so if somebody started a new process or a new it, farm, it, if you change, that's different. Yes, right. If you change, you know, your existing process. Right. Then obviously, that would create its own thing. But yeah. how does that? Now I just want to be educated here. The, there's a lot of people in town, um, even across the street from me. My old neighbors had chickens, yeah. and then ones behind them have chickens. And you see more and more. And I know 
it's uh, I don't know if there's a term for mm. resident or residential chicken farming or something like that. I don't know some backyard. Something, yeah, mm. backyard it became farm. a big hobby. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. like especially said, so if you're not, yeah. that's mm. not established. So you have to establish the year. Yeah. Well, well we, that one changed just to be clear. Right. It's, you, you still are limited by whatever right. the, the yeah. zoning set so it's right. yeah and it's, that's no i'm yeah. not obviously that, yeah but this the, he said that you had to be established for i'm not yeah i'm not entirely you know we want to be careful i think you know before we would even move forward no, I you know we should probably have somebody from land use come here and 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 you know i think we're both giving you know what what we've learned from this but but really you know we're this is just the initial talks right and so no, I you know there's yeah. no stipulations that the law only applies to commercial but you're right if you were just doing it as a residential it might be hard to establish but then again most people with chickens post them all on facebook and you can just look up oh. <laughs> i don't know if that would count but i mean as, as, facebook is what got me as here. a kid i raised rabbits i had rabbits in the backyard i remember i had three or four of my neighbors they would wheel my rabbit and lure away and put it in their garden they were happy to get it but you know i I'm just thinking about somebody trying to stretch the re the the law, the letter of the law, and with larger animals, and you know, it, and I and I understand it. There's zoning regulations to that effect, and I think it would be covered. Now, I, all in all, my my only my only question is, I think it may increase the need for there may be some more zoning enforcement officer work out there. You know, right? And you're going to need somebody that knows the rules and says, hey, listen. Mm -hmm. He's had chickens here for four and a half years. You just moved in next door. He's kept it clean. Everything's been fine. That's the way it is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's very true because obviously I, your post was very favorably taken. Mm -hmm. But there's been other well, posts that we've I, seen I, about those roosters and, and they go in a different route. So you're right. I think there'd be more need for someone. And obviously, if they fall within the guidelines, then that's how it is. Well, I'm, I'm here just advocating for the right to farm. I'm yeah. not advocating for my own personal. Yeah, yeah. No, but I, I, but mm -hmm. I, I appreciate what you do. That, I mean, well, would I like to be able to keep what I have? Sure, but that that wouldn't be something I would do here, and that would be like I would sit down with land use because mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. like to see that you know if you have a quarter acre of land, well, you can have four hens. But if you go to tractor supply, you have to buy a minimum of six. <laughs> if you go to Adams and you, you buy, you know, your chicken or your eggs, that chicken did have nothing but a couple of square feet its whole life. So if you have a quarter acre, I'm not saying you can by yeah. any means have 50 chickens, but I don't see where you couldn't have a minimum of, of say, six. Mm -hmm. Especially considering a lot of people, I have a friend of mine who owns 47 acres here in town. He has 16 chickens, and they roam an area, or they are basically free range an area smaller than what mine do on these things, mm -hmm. because mine have a much bigger area. Because he doesn't openly free range his chickens; they're just in a run the whole time. I let mine; I, my whole backyard is fenced in. They don't get loose, but I let them out. So the last hour or two of the day, they can kind of enjoy the sunshine. But they, you know, so it's. Again, this would be something that I would take up with zoning, but I think it would be a good thing to have on the books. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you. Obviously, you're more <laughs> involved with it, researching this, so certainly I understand the, the logic of making sure that there's not nuisance lawsuits brought against people. So on the average, what does, I mean, because if you're following the ordinances, then you should be safe but you could be tied up and cost you. You could still be sued. So does I it have? Basically, I'm, on the civil side. Yeah. Not. The, obviously, if you're covered by the town, you, you, your everything is, you know, your zoning. Your, you know, they say you can have so many of whatever animal. You're zoned for that. You've done all the setbacks where all your your whatever buildings that you keep them in, everything is in accordance. Well, if your neighbor still has an issue with the things you can't control, i.e., you know, the, the smell of the manure or the sound of a rooster crowing or the sound of a horse or a cow, and it's something that they take advantage, uh, take issue with, they could still sue you in civil court. So do you see, when you were looking at this stuff, do you see where people have actually won in civil yes. court? Yes. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think what we'll do, um, I think going forward is we'll add this to the agenda for our, uh, for our next meeting, which is June 1st. And we'll Makes have this under old business. Makes sense. And we'll continue the conversation. But I do want, yeah, thank you, Sam. And, and it's always, it really is nice to see whenever an issue gets brought up you know, and, and gets people talking on our budget referendum, as, as nice as it was to have the budget passed by such a healthy margin, uh, I really want to get our participation up in, in <laughs> town government. And so I think, you know, I, I, thank you, Sam. Uh, are, you, are you saying, Mr. First Selectman, that it's something to crow about? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. You know, I think we're, I think we're ready for status I, I, I had to. reports. <laughs> All right, thank you, John. All right, thank you. So status and committee reports. Um, I'll, I will, I'll just start off. Uh, I do uh, want to announce that we, um, we had a, an announcement today at Town Hall. There, there's a personnel change. Our public works director, Bob Shea, has, uh, has announced that he has taken the position of Carl Johnson, who is retiring in the Board of Ed for uh, the facilities. And he will be leaving the Public Works as of June 17th. So Bob's not going very far, but um, certainly, um, and we wish, him, we wish him all the best, but um, that does, that will leave a, uh, a how public. Do we, how do we cover that in the interim? Is, does he have a backup, or is he willing to straddle two jobs for a while, or how do we do that? Well, we're working on a plan. Today was day one, <laughs> so I, so we have a month. We have a, we do have a month to prepare, and uh, certainly Bob is. Uh, let me know that you know he is you know around. He's not going very far, but um, but this was the right move for him at the right time, and so. Uh, so it is certainly the Board of Education's game because uh, Bob is such a wonderful employee and, uh, and we're lucky and we're happy to keep him uh, under the town umbrella. So that's good news. And on that front, we have hired, as, as Meg alluded to, a town planner who will be starting, I wanna get the correct date. Our town planner will be starting on June 20th and that is uh, Dan Bure. Dan had worked for the town of Portland previously as our zoning enforcement officer years ago. He has uh, since been working in, in the land use office in another town and, and he has accepted a position with us and we're looking forward to bringing him in. Uh, so those are, those are my updates at Town Hall. Ralph, I guess <laughs> you have a few. Yep, uh, I will start with uh, Park and Rec. So what to say about Park and Rec is that uh, everything go is going well at, at our, our new park. There's certainly lots of activity. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, always busy there. Um, one thing to note is that a tree was donated by the Garden Club that was uh, put up on the top of the hill by the uh, by these um, playground equipment. So. So that, that, that was very nice, and it's, it's been planted there. Um, they have, a, let's see, do I have something else? I think that's it for the park. Hey, do we, hmm? are we done with the park yet? Like, closed out on it? We are not closed out on the project. We're still waiting for the, inv the uh, invoice from uh, the developer. Okay. Still not done, as far as I know. Thing. There's also a plaque. And the plaque where, we're trying to get the pro final prices on the plaque. So those are the two things left. Um, summer camp, so they have established a summer camp uh, hours that they will have with their program. Um, and right now, Nate is working on trying to get all the staff hired. So that is what he's working on right now. Um, they're certainly preparing for the concert series. And what I'd say is there's been good sponsorship for the concert series and uh, the organizations that continue to be generous in supporting the, the series continue to be generous. So we certainly appreciate that. And um, the last thing with, well, let's see, community gardens. So the community gardens up at Rose Hill have been uh, prepped 
and they're ready to be planted. So um, I know that I think the plots have been marked out, so it's just a matter of who the people approach to, to be able to plant up there can, can start reaching out to, to have uh, select a plot, get a plot. Yeah, and the last thing I would say is that just, uh, they started, we started talking about the 5K. It's on October 29th, so <laughs> put it in your book if you, so you could run it. I expect all of us to run it this yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. I always do photos, so I can't <laughs> run it, sorry. <laughs> Um, I, I transport the abs, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on to water and sewer, um, Bob did indicate when we were at the meeting that the water quality reports are out and available for anyone. I know there's been things raised on our favorite Facebook site about that, but um, the water quality is, the, is passing everything it should be passing. So. Um, so that's there. The state did uh, back up our selection of uh, a consultant to do the work in checking and finding spots of water within town. And they will be, I guess they'll be coming to us or we'll have some sort of a resolution with regards to that, I think. Coming the Board up. of Slackman will be approving it, most likely at our June 1st meeting. So we'll be talking yeah. about that. Um, there is hydrant work going on, and one of them, I would say, is on Strong Ave. They're actually going to have to move it because of how things were set up. But there was one interesting thing that everyone should be aware of. Bob said that in the last month, four hydrants have been hit, which, which is truly unbelievable. But, you know, and I think uh, in two of the situations, they were able to find who did it and there'll be insurance that'll be covered, but on the other two situations, you're, you don't have coverage, so we, we, we get hurt by that. So, um, you know, I know he, and he, in the other meetings, he's talked a lot about our stop signs and our signs disappearing or being damaged, so it's a significant impact at a town when, when you look at the numbers and how much we have to pay out for doing repairs. So people should be mindful of that. Uh, and the last thing, EDC, um, I don't remember if you had announced this, Ryan, I don't think you no, had, but the not. RFP, the RFP was issued for the riverfront and that's out there and the intent would be to, I think it's towards the end of the, towards the end of the summer is waiting to get all the responses back. September, because, September 13th. Yeah. Yep. So that's out there. Um, and they're also looking for additional grant opportunities related to that property, right? So, yes. So yes, that, they're, they're doing work on that. Um, the EDC did set up a survey monkey. I, I don't know if it's in finalized form, but it will be soon. Um, with questions to bring out to the businesses in town, specifically to trying to get some feedback on, you know, what their opinion is, how things are in town, and where they think they could need, you know, could use help and support. So they have that set up. Um, they are actually going to walk, start off by walking Main Street uh, tomorrow afternoon and passing out a sheet that will have the link to get to the survey so that they'll start with trying to work with the, uh, the businesses in, on Main Street to get their feedback. And um, the last thing is with regards is that there is, and everyone here would know, is that uh, we do have a joint meeting with EDC. Um, tomorrow at 10 a.m. for anyone that can make it. And we're gonna be out at the Brainerd property getting an update from uh, Dan Bertram with regards to the status of what's going on. So, and that's what I have. Any, that's 10 a.m. Yep. Any other uh, status in committee reports? I do wanna highlight that uh, and I want to get the right dates here because this is our last meeting before Memorial Day. And we have um, the American Legion. There will be a breakfast, uh, Veterans Day breakfast at the American Legion on May 28th from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. This is their first breakfast since COVID. So we're looking forward to getting back. So please, I encourage everyone to come support our veterans in town and uh, get some great breakfast. And then May 29th will be our Memorial Day Parade and that begins at 2 p.m. And we uh, line up and get ready by the professional building by Company 2 down on Main Street. So 
Looking forward to seeing everyone there, and uh, hopefully we have some sunshine after last year's <laughs> very rainy and cold Memorial Day. So, hey, one other thing uh, I did verify: 11 to 2 is Juneteenth. 11 a.m. to 2. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. All right. With no more status and committee reports, we'll move on to public comment. Yeah, 7 p.m. 7, 7 p.m. Okay. Thank, thank you, Jan. All right. We'll move on then no, with no more public comment to general informal discussion. Uh, I have a couple questions. Yeah. Not the price, but do we know when we're getting a quote for the truck? A quote? Yes. Uh, well, we have our RFQ is out okay. right now. Um, I believe the deadline is coming up too. It might even be this Friday. I'd have to check. I think it's the 20th. Okay. So I know that we did a walkthrough. I think Mike, you were, you were at the walkthrough. Yeah. I believe several companies. There were three companies three? there. Three. Yeah. yeah. So that's encouraging that mm -hmm. we have three companies, three uh, you know engineering firms. It's nice to have competition instead of yeah. just one person. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Un underneath the rubber coat, that's asphalt. Right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Is yeah. is asphalt? Up to oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah, crazy. Yep. It's full yeah. excavation. They yeah. said. <laughs> um, yeah. Next, uh, where are we on the Russell Avenue project for the water main and for the pump station? Uh, that is with our finance director at the moment, I believe. So okay. it's it's moving along, but it's just it's, it's, we're getting there. But I th I think there's some uh, I think we have to. He, uh, Bob, I talked to Bob. He said they were uh, going to go out for a bid for engineering so that we can get that wrapped up and then get that taken care of. Okay. So we have to go to bid for engineering and then bid mm -hmm. for construction. Right. right. Great. So, I think um, that what the discussion is about whether we truly have to to bid or not. Mm -hmm. on it. I think right. that's where it's kind of hanging. Because mm -hmm. yeah. the discussion, we, why, why we have we're already using that's services. Town engineering. Right. Yeah. That's what, when I talked to Bob, it's that's what he was saying. Uh, Can we just to, go with our yeah. town? But to highlight this, the reason for this discussion is because this is, this is American rescue money. Right. And whenever <laughs> we have to be very careful mm -hmm. with yeah. how we use our American rescue money and, and make sure that maybe we, we cross all our T's twice. Yep. And I think that's why we're having that conversation. So we're working on that. Okay. Um, and last, could, even if it's not our next meeting, the meeting after, Kim, for new business, we add the uh, House. fixing the real property tax assessment. Well, we could, we could. I don't know what the next meeting looks like if there's too much. But I would. I, I would say probably the next meeting is our financial meeting mm -hmm. in June. It's also our last financial meeting of the fiscal year. Yep. So typically, I, I think there's going to be a lot on the agenda. I would, my suggestion would be the second meeting in June. Typically, the second meeting of the month, uh, we have more time than we do at a financial meeting. Right. And, and I'll be honest, it's been on my list to do more research on it, I, and I have. I have a lot of information to go through and uh, as well as reach out to our town attorney and I just haven't been able to get there yet you know what I mean yep. so I just need a little bit more time before you know but um, but if you'd like to you know visit or stop by town hall I have plenty of material that if you'd like to read and, and go through to yep. get the to get the ball rolling on that okay. Okay. but we can talk it's on our follow-up items so we can yeah. You know, we can address it. If there's something you know you want to talk about, you know, we can. We can. No, I just wanted to, you know, not lose it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's yeah. on. It's 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 on the agenda. Right. <laughs> it's yeah. there. Yeah. You want to move it forward. 
Yeah, yeah. I want to put it in bigger print front. towards the top. <laughs> yeah. Well, the nice thing is with with that, the fixing of you know what we have on the books exists, mm -hmm. and also because we just went through uh, the the end, the budget was adopted. We now have a mill rate for the fiscal year. Uh, so we we do have some time. We can we're flexible. There's not a rush to get this through. So we, I want to make sure that we we do it right. I was I was thinking it can kind of be our, our summer project, if right. you will, or one of yeah. them uh, to to work on. So so yeah. Any any other items on? Okay. We'll move on to follow up items. And I, I don't have anything uh, unless the selectmen would would like to uh, to discuss anything. We have our or ethics ordinance, uh, our review of town charter, which also I think is is an important project that I think that we should look at at some point. Uh, we may need to have a charter committee yes. at some point to uh, to look at it. it. It has been quite some time since we've adopted a, mm -hmm. a new town charter, so it, it's always good to to look at that. And, and then the policy on fixing uh, the real property assessment as well. So both of those, I think, are something that I know this board wants to get done, and, and so we can we can move forward with that. And if there's no other business, I'll entertain a motion to I'll adjourn. I'll make a motion we adjourn. I'll second that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. Thank you all, and have a great night. Just what would you do if somebody was opposed to that? <laughs> <laughs>